Hi there, you are listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. My name is Matt Wakeling and this is the show that I produce in Sydney, Australia, where I speak to leading guitar players from all around the world. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology, the online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott, former head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology in LA and also the McNally Smith Music School. Fantastic teacher and a fantastic guitar player. Now in today's episode, I'm stepping it back four years when I first met Joe, who was introduced to me through Jude Gold from Guitar Player Magazine and the No Guitar Is Safe podcast. I met Joe, we had a great conversation which you'll hear today. And uh, on from that, we developed a really good relationship. We got on great in that interview. Joe ended up introducing me to a number of other musicians who became guests on the show. Incredible guitarists like Scott Henderson, Gil Paris, and Joel Hoekstra. All of those guys would not have been on the show if it was not for Joe. In the last... I don't know, a year or so, Joe has been talking to me about his fretboard biology course. I ended up becoming a beta tester, and in 2021, fretboard biology came on as a sponsor of the Guitar Speak podcast. So it's been a cool relationship. It's just developed in a very organic way, and I think what Joe's doing is fantastic in the online teaching space. Here's a couple of words about the course. If you're tired of wading through hundreds of random guitar videos and just want to become a better player, Fretboard Biology is your answer. Fretboard Biology is a self-paced, college-level program that will give you the right instruction, in the right amounts, and in the right order. You'll learn the same information I taught to thousands of other guitar players over 30 years of teaching in top music colleges. If you want to make real progress with your guitar playing, then sign up for a free 7-day trial at fretboardbiology.com. All right, the links to Fretboard Biology are in our show notes. But now we're going to listen back to our conversation with Joe back in 2017. We'll talk about his Truth Serum album. We'll listen to some of his killer playing and find out how he ended up being the head of guitar at some of the United States' most prestigious guitar colleges. Here's a track called Distant Early Warning. Joe Elliott, welcome to the Guitar Speak podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you. Now, you, um, I understand, grew up in Indiana. What what was your start on guitar? Well, uh, my my parents, uh, my father was a a minister, and so we moved about every four or five years to a new town, to a new church. And uh, when we moved up to Iowa, when I was about, I don't know, 11 or so, wanted to play guitar and in my uh, in my junior high school the general music teacher she had a guitar there and they had baritone ukuleles which are the top four strings of guitar uh-huh. for the music class and man I as soon as I could get my hands on one I started playing one 
my older brothers and sisters were all listening to all the the pop and soul and music of the time and my dad was listening to big band jazz music and my mom was listening to classical music so I was the last one in the chain and I was the one that wanted to play music so I was fortunate to have this uh, junior high teacher who was very nurturing by uh, letting me play her guitar and, and just kind of you know giving me some tools that's great sounds like you had some good listening amongst the uh, family as well good broad range of stuff that you were uh, that you got to Absolutely. listen to in the house yeah it was uh it, and it you know it 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 goes i can feel the influences of it today here as a as a no longer young man you know i mean that's that's i still i've always had broad taste in music and appreciation for anything that's played well and written well awesome did you um did you have any opportunity to play in bands or was there um did you end up playing in church was that an option <clears throat> for a guitar player oh a little bit uh that was um you know, in the early, in the seventies, uh, you know, even in the the Catholic and the Protestant churches, uh, you know, acoustic guitars were being used in services, and they were trying to integrate. But most of my uh, playing was, you know, I wanted to form a rock band, so mm-hmm. I was kind of living in two worlds. On on Sunday, I was at church with mom and dad and family, but you know, during the week, whenever I could get uh, my buds together to, to to jam, we'd play. So. You know, right away, I think I was about 13, I wanted 14, I first got my first guitar, I started a band, and, you know, we were, we didn't know much, but we we did know that we wanted to be in a rock band, so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so we started, uh, we started playing, uh, we actually, there were, there were gigs to play, uh, even when I was in junior high, even if they were school-sponsored dances on a thursday okay. afternoon yeah. after school you get to you had the opportunity to to play in front of an audience and feel feel that coming back you know so yeah i was very fortunate in, in junior high to do that and then in high school we had moved to uh, montana which is a very rural state and uh i joined i formed and joined bands there and we had many opportunities to perform live uh we we would drive out to the, the surrounding ranch towns and farm towns and play homecoming dances and and uh, uh, you know proms in the spring and uh, there were just lots of opportunities to play I mean I made <clears throat> I made a decent amount of money in high school just running running being a band leader and running running the the rock and pop bands I was I was playing in. that's great what what sort of material would you guys do well, those were the days of um, the Doobie Brothers, beginning of ZZ Top. But uh, at different times, we had horn sections. We were we loved Chicago, and we loved uh, you know I was a big fan of Terry Kath, the original guitarist of mm-hmm. of Chicago. Chicago yeah. um, and uh, you know whatever the the all the top forty pop stuff at the time. Uh, and a uh, big fan of the Doobie Brothers back then, and very very broad <clears throat> taste in music. But we we played uh, nearly every weekend and a couple nights a weekend uh, from my junior and senior year of high school, which was you know incredible experience. Just not really knowing what you're doing, just learning by performing and making mistakes and judging audience reaction and and all of that. <clears throat> yeah. Great experience, great education. Fantastic, and it sounds like a rich um, bunch of songs you were learning in terms of you know getting your guitar playing together. Who were the guitar players you were looking up to at this stage? Well, I certainly back then I mentioned Terry Cass. Yeah, yeah. He was, uh, I you know, he was uh, such a phenomenal guitar player and, and so such an unusual combination of talent for that era. You know, there are, there are great stories of Jimi Hendrix being in awe of Terry Cass mm-hmm. and. Um, Yet, you know, harmonically, he could span the range from playing key center rock solos and very aggressive Hendrix-like things to uh, playing through chord changes uh, very gracefully and tastefully. But what I always liked from him was just his uh, very aggressive, um, appropriately aggressive uh, style. He was he was uh, not somebody that back 
backed away from anything when he was soloing. He was a tasty player, but very aggressive. Besides him, <clears throat> I, I liked Billy Gibbons uh, a lot. I liked uh, um, uh, the Doobie Brother guys. Tommy Johnson was a, was a hero of mine. Joe Walsh was the guy I loved to listen to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I would say uh, through my high school years, those were the guys. I also liked Bruce Conte for Tower Power. I was a big Tower Power R&B okay. yeah, yeah. soul band. And so that was a whole nother area. <clears throat> my brother, my one of my brothers uh, turned me on to Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, and that whole <clears throat> uh funk guitar thing uh got into my into my mind back then too and uh so i listened to an awful lot of that earth wind and fire was a big influence on me al al Steele, chess mckay who was the architect for a lot of those great tower or uh, excuse me uh, earth wind and fire parts another big influence and uh then i heard uh, the george benson breezen record okay Uh, yeah yeah. when i was a senior in high school i thought wow this is a this is cool. <laughs> What's this? <clears throat> so, you know, I keep chasing shiny objects when it comes to guitar players and music. <laughs> That's great. That's interesting because when I hear you're playing now, and um, we'll, we'll talk about your new album um, as well, I'm really keen to dig into that, but I hear, I do hear all those things now that you mentioned them. I hear like an aggressive uh, digging in, which is, which you don't always hear with that West Coast kind of influence. Um and yet there's groove and there's funk as well. So you're actually were hearing all this really as a young man. That's very, very interesting. Yeah, it just I, I, I've really had an interesting and, and, and fun career. Just, uh, you know, not only the, the range of things, styles that I've gotten to do performing and with the, some of the level of musicians that I've gotten to play with in all these different styles, but also just because of my life as an educator too, uh, teaching at GIT for so many years and being exposed and teaching alongside of all those great guys and all the great students. Yeah. And then moving to the Twin Cities here in Minnesota, which is such a rich uh, music scene here and, uh-huh. and the whole Prince influence here. Uh, it's, I've had a... Uh, uh, I've had a really fun career, you know, so far and a lot of, but, but a wide range of experiences. So it's hard to nail it all down. It's not a simple story. <laughs> you mentioned GIT. When did you decide to move there to study? Cause you were first a student before you were teaching there. Is that right? I was, um, <clears throat> I learned about, uh, GIT and back in 1970s, eight or nine it was just a young thing and I, okay. and I was uh, attending Montana State University as a music major and we took a, our band director took us down there our big band uh, for a jazz festival and there was a, a guitarist Mundell Lowe who was uh, one of the new teachers there and he was he did a clinic and, and he was you know pumping up the school and I said wow I gotta get I gotta find out about this place because at that time I'd been <clears throat> by that time I'd been exposed to Another big influence of mine, which was Larry Carlton and Robin Ford. Okay, Those guys were yeah. big, big heroes of mine. Yeah. And so I had my sights on L.A. I thought, that's where I got to go. I got to get out of Montana and get down there. And uh, so he told me about this school, and I thought, wow, that sounds perfect. And I, uh, when I got back home from that trip, I did some research. I don't know how you did research back then. Didn't go online, probably. I don't <laughs> yes. know how I did. I probably checked Guitar Player Magazine or something. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and anyway, I applied, and I was accepted. And that was about 1980, but, uh, or 80, 79. But I, um, I uh, had just gotten married as a super young man, and uh, I also joined a band that went on the road. For, well, uh, yeah, well, at first I had moved. We did move down to L.A., and uh, my goal was to go to school there. But the money wasn't there, and I was unhappy with the band I was playing at. My wife was a 20-year-old girl who was not digging L.A. Okay. <laughs> so we, we packed up and left and uh, ended up going on the road for about four years all across America and Canada touring with uh, uh, back when the club scene was just hot in America. I mean, mm-hmm. it was just amazing. There were bands everywhere, and there was work everywhere. And uh, so when that was done, about 85, I, I finally got to go to GIT. Okay. And and I had matured a lot as a person and player, so I was really ready to accept 
the information I was about to get, you know. So it was it was actually it all worked out pretty well because I had four years of of hard road playing. You know, we're talking six nights a week, yeah, wow. fifty two weeks a year. So I I had uh, I was ready, you know, and it was a fantastic experience to be. Uh, around all those players i met scott henderson and frank and bali and joe diorio and got to play with joe pass in in uh private settings and wow. and wow. you know some all these guys that i only dreamed about yeah. were sitting right there and i could talk to them and i could ask them questions and so uh it was a really uh a game changer for me moving moving to la the second time Yes, and staying yes. and then being exposed to all these people who really set the bar obviously quite high it seems to me like by the mid 80s git was really hitting its stride though so for you to land there back there at, at you know at that stage seems like um seems like good timing i would i would say that yeah because it was um it had it had matured to the point where it was attracting I mean, there were a lot of guitar players there, mm-hmm. and so there's a, the upside of that and the downside of that. The upside of that is that if you've got 350 guitar players, the the chances for 50 or 100 of those to be really good is much higher than if you you know it's a percentage game. So of course <clears throat> they were, and so that that also allowed the school to hire even more great people to be on on staff there. And uh, so you just, it was just a fantastic experience. Uh, and I owe a lot to so many teachers there who were genuinely uh, interested in sharing their gifts, you know. That's all I can say about that. So I was going to ask, what led to you um, taking a teaching role then? So you, I guess towards the end of your time there, was, was that opportunity becoming clear or how did that come about? While I was stu- a student, um, uh, the late great Ross Bolton, who uh, was Al Jarrell's gr- guitarist for for many many years, who unfortunately passed away a couple years ago. Uh, Ross started uh, calling. He knew of my, you know, a lot of the teachers knew that I had a lot of experience before I came there because I had done a lot of gigs, and I started yeah, sure. subbing for Ross and some other teachers. Wow! And they they would call me to play the gigs because I, <clears throat> you know, I had. Uh, a ver, uh, I had the versatile, versatile gene, you know. I could I could move into a lot of things just because of the experience I'd had playing before in yeah. in, in funk, R and B, rock settings, country settings, even jazz. And um, so, I, you know, I just kind of got in with the guys. And like you said, that was a period of time when and when uh, MI Musicians Institute and specifically GIT, which is the guitar. Yeah. component of mi was really growing <clears throat> and uh they needed guys and so i mean i started teaching right after i graduated which was an amazing uh you know stroke of luck i guess i could call it luck or whatever but it was a, a good thing for me because it it all of a sudden i i had a steady ga- day gig that was uh afforded me the luxury of being around all these great guys and great players uh and you know if 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 you just roll into la without any connections it's a rough place okay and to have a platform uh to work from like a gig like that where you know uh, at first i didn't have health insurance and i don't i don't want to talk about boring stuff like that but those are real world things i mean how are you going to pay your rent how are you going to you know how are you going to support yourself while you're pursuing your you know, you're supporting your music habit, you know, through, through, through something, right? Absolutely. So for me, it was, uh, it was great. And, uh, um, you know, I started teaching a couple days a week to start with. And, um, within a couple of years, there was a teacher there who's now at USC. His name's Richard Smith, who's a fine guitarist. And Richard was doing a lot of classes and, uh, he left to go, uh, take over the guitar department at USC and, uh, Ron Benson, who was running the guitar department, along with Keith Wyatt <clears throat> um, at uh, GIT, said, you want Richard's schedule? And I said, yes, I do. <laughs> so <laughs> all of a sudden, my, my gig went from a couple days a week to a full-time gig where I was teaching classes. And, you know, 
helping write with curriculum and and that kind of thing. So it uh, again after a couple of years of that of uh, just teaching there, I I moved into an, a nice spot there, which which really afforded me the luxury of not starving, you know. Yeah. And I know it sounds kind of funny, but if you just if you just show up in L.A. without too many connections. It's it's a tough place, especially you know back then, and and I don't know what it would be like today to to roll in there. Um, I would imagine it'd be about the same. It's, it, I'm sure it hasn't gotten any easier, you know. Sure, <clears throat> sure. Well, that's the thing. There's there's always this romantic idea that you'll you'll go off somewhere and make it or, or get your foot in the door somehow. But if if you're struggling to put food on the table and and a roof over your head, that does not leave a lot of creative energy to actually make great music well yeah exactly and it erodes your self self-esteem i've seen it you know i've taught thousands of guitar players in my career <clears throat> and most of them in my 23 years at, at gat mm -hmm. and you see people come in from all over the world and they're eager and there's energy and there's hope and 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 there's all that and and you know i always i, I you turn into a, a sort of a a, a mock shrink uh, when you're there and okay. when, and whenever you're dealing with students, because you're sure. trying to, uh, prop, keep people propped up and, uh, don't, you know, you don't want people to get discouraged because that's the biggest enemy to creativity and people reaching their potential is mm -hmm. if, you know, you've got to feel good about yourself and your chances and you need to feed that, that your art, a monster, you know, and when you're just struggling and things just aren't going well, <clears throat> it's devastating. And so much talent gets, well, it just never gets realized because of those kind of things. So you can imagine for me uh, having the opportunity to, uh, you know, be able to teach during the day and play and write and record at night. And uh, it was, uh, uh, I look back on it now and I, I got really lucky. So I feel really, really fortunate about that. Yeah, sure. But with also the, the skill base and all your hard work, I'm sure, um, led into all that as well. I think it sounds to me like a perfect storm of actually you really working hard uh, and also being in the right place at the right time. I think uh, there was no substitute for your hard work either. It seems like you were gigging a lot as well and um, doing lots of uh, recording dates. That that point you mentioned is really interesting about LA and that was my impression that there there seemed to be so much work there but absolutely so many guitar players. Yeah. So you kept busy, though. Tell me about some of the gigs that, that you landed and that you were doing. When I was in, in L.A., uh, I did uh, a, just a wide range of things. I mean, <clears throat> right when I got done with GAT, uh, I had, you know, consciously spread myself out as wide as, as possible. I was playing with a, with a big seven-piece, uh, excuse me, nine-piece tower power type horn band uh called balance that was produced by emilio castillo uh of tower yeah, awesome. uh, and then i was playing in a rockabilly band uh with a songwriter i was doing my own uh band uh fusion you know four piece uh guitar instrumental stuff uh i was playing in an elvis band i was <laughs> i was playing in a country <laughs> band yeah I was playing in a couple top 40. I was in seven different things at the same time, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh -huh. And uh, now they weren't all playing every night of the week, but over the course of a month, uh, I probably would, you know, play with all these things. And so uh, a really interesting connection happened for me. Uh, I got hooked in with uh, a lot of the uh, East L.A. guys and uh, the whole... Um, <clears throat> It's a blend of Latin, all Latin styles that happens in East L.A. It's not just Mexican-American. There are Cuban-Americans there from all over Latin America. There are, are people in, and musicians who live in East L.A. And that turned into a whole nother uh, music experience for me, learning from the street guys uh, a lot of, about Latin music. And uh, there are a lot of artists uh, there um, Balance was one of the bands. It was a, um, a singer named Mike Jimenez, who so many great musicians in LA have gone through his band. It's also his big, big band, salsa band. And um, so that was a big experience for me. Um, I 
I spend an awful lot of time of my time playing uh, my music uh, as often as I could in, in the, the the jazz club, the Baked Potato in L.A. I don't know if you know that name oh, of that absolutely. club. It's a legendary and, club, right? So um, I uh, also did uh, an R and B. Uh, band with uh, uh, Carol Rogers from Sergio Mendez band. It started off being a Brazilian band that we uh -huh. put together, but it, it evolved into a uh, backbeat, almost a Tina Turner R&B type band. And uh -huh. we worked the baked potato quite often, and that was a fun gig. I did uh, a lot of session work for songwriters, uh, you know, a lot of it demo work. Um, and then m my life was also, uh, you know, obviously consumed um, – in ninety seven by uh, in nineteen ninety seven they I was asked to be the department head for the guitar program for GIT. Yeah. And so fantastic. suddenly, you know, that started consuming more of my time. And then in two thousand, uh, not because I pursued it, I ended up being VP of education there, which is essentially the dean running the education part of the school. Okay. And um, And does that cover that, all of the schools? Is that um not only yeah, the guitar I was, school, but the right the other areas. So I, what I would do, I would supervise the department heads for for the guitar, bass, drum, keyboard, vocal, recording, film, music business. I, they were, uh, they, those were all my responsibility. The all those department heads, and that was a that was a massive job that I never I never asked for, <laughs> but ended up doing for for uh, you know eight eight years. And uh, okay. and so my during that time, I really scale back a lot of my performing i did my gigs uh my own you know fusion thing at the at the big potato mm -hmm. and i did uh you know some of the other ones but i just there just wasn't the bandwidth to to uh sure, be, sure. be out every night you know just it wasn't happening and i was raising four children at the same time yep. with my wife so mm -hmm. you know all that takes your t takes your time so yeah absolutely but i never stopped uh you know writing and uh you know, I've always, of course, playing. I kept my chops up through all that, and because, uh, uh, you know, that was just a priority for me. Mm -hmm. So, what what did your rig look like around that time? So late nineties. Yeah. What's, well, a, what's an LA guy the... playing on the gig? <laughs> I had rachitis back in ninety one <laughs> or ninety two. We all did, and yeah. <laughs> so before that, I had a. Uh, I got to tell you what I used before that was a. a, a Mesa Boogie Mark Two B that I bought in 1984, 85. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, and, awesome. And which I own again today, the very same amplifier. Oh, really? Exact amplifier. But in about 91 or 92, everybody was going to racks, okay. and so, uh, you know, I was looking at it. So I asked Scott Henderson what to buy, you know, because mm -hmm. I just, you know, some of these guys had the time and the money, or or. Maybe I should say they were they took the time <laughs> to to really check out all the gear and yeah. and everything and they were and uh, so Scott made some recommendations back then on what he did so at that time my it's the rack is there's a picture of it on my website actually and it's got a uh, it's got a uh, a boogie quad preamp yep, yep. which was uh, designed to be four preamps in one so you could have four presets. And the power stage was a Boogie 295 power amp. Then in between that, I had, um, oh, I think I had an old MIDI verb. I had a couple micro verbs. Mm -hmm. I had a uh, Ibanez SDR 1000 delay, which was the same one that I think uh, Holdsworth used. I know Scott Henderson used it. Uh -huh. we'll <laughs> so I, I, bought all, I bought all these things and I put it together and it just sounded like hell. You know, it just <laughs> sounded all of a sudden the guts were gone and and I thought, Really, you know, you just don't buy the stuff, and it doesn't magically sound good. So, <laughs> Scott was uh, was kind enough to invite me over to his house because I was just, you know, I don't think I was quite in tears, but but I was, you know, he had such a phenomenal sound, and he yeah, was, yeah. you know, was a still a guitar player I look up to a lot okay. because yep. of all kinds of reasons that are obvious. So, I took my my pile of stuff in my rack over to to Scott's house and. He had in his living room, he had his stuff set up, and so we set up my stuff side by side, and it was, you know, it was, it was pitiful how, how I sounded compared to his. But he made a couple small adjustments that were, that were 
just amazing. One was was to make this thing a stereo rig. Okay. And yep. so we we took uh, we took the the the, the basic fundamental thing that that changed my life and why i'm still a stereo guy to this day is we took this old uh effectron 1024 delay unit that were uh, everybody had in pas back in the 70s and 80s everybody had an effectron and so what we did was split the signal coming out of the preamp and one side went through this effectron and then off you know onto the left side Mm -hmm. and the other side went to the right side. Well, the right side was the, the straight signal uh, time-wise that came out of the preamp. The okay. left side, the Effectron, uh, we, the mix was 100%, and it was delayed about 5 or 10 milliseconds uh-huh. and detuned slightly yep. so that all of a sudden this dimension happened. And, and, yeah. I, and I, it just it blew me away. And, <laughs> and that was... Um, that was a, a, a real moment, you know, uh, f- for me because all of a sudden I had I went from this puny little th- sound, and there I mean there were other adjustments we made to things in the rack too, but um, but uh, that was major. And then and then that Ibanez SDR one thousand. I don't know if you're familiar with that old piece of gear. Yeah, it's a single space rack, and and um, yeah, and and you know the 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 simple principles of of rack building like splitting the signal, detuning one side, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, EQing the long delays so that uh, they're more of a shadow than okay. uh, than a irritating uh, replica. Replica, you know. Sure. So uh, I'd say those are those were the the big uh, rack discoveries, uh, or I would say you know things that Scott helped me get get to. And then okay. I I use that rack, God, almost um, ninety. Early '90s, I made very f- little changes in that thing for 15 years, probably. And okay. then, you know, everybody started fading away from racks, and I got tired of hauling it around. Sure. Uh, when I when I didn't have somebody to do it for me. Well, and those so, those uh, two nine fives are heavy, and that's that's just the power amp, and that plus you got other stuff in there. I know. Well, it was it was it was ridiculous. You know, I it, it uh, <laughs> I had a special special thing in the back of my pickup that where I could you know carry it around town uh, comfortably but uh yeah what? i still have it it sits out in my garage here in minnesota uh-huh. and uh every now and then i i open it up and go yep there it is you know <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what what yeah. speakers were you using evls and okay they were yep. t- teal cabinets and i still have those too yep. and uh those are i closed up the ports and they're closed back cabinets oh, okay. so they had yep. a lot of punch yep and they threw a long way so uh, one twelve, two twelves, one tw- yeah. Each cabinet had one twelve. Okay, and, okay, yeah, yeah. And those would, those EVs, they tell it like it is. They're very unforgiving. So uh, <laughs> I, I I still have them, and uh, I, I'm kind of a pack rat with old old stuff. So sure. uh, someday I, I you know the rack probably just has to go, and unless there's some some uh, Renaissance period. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Yeah, the, I mean racks were huge down here as well, and um, the moment for me was when I, I noticed I was just slipping one or two pedals back into my signal chain, and uh, mm-hmm. eventually everything just went back. Uh, right. It's what we saw down here anyway. Yeah, well, and I had you know I had uh, I had an early version of the uh, ground control, you know, oh, okay. switching system, the foot switching, yeah, yeah. and uh, the guy who wired who eventually really wired my rack. Uh, in a very professional way, he was a, a guy who's been a friend of mine since the '80s. His name's Curtis Lar, and he's a uh, Curtis is a, has been a guitar tech for everybody from Guns N' Roses to Def Leppard to he's worked with John Bryan quite a bit, T-Bone T- 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 Burnett. Uh, I mean, he's toured with with everybody. Dwight Yoakam, I, I can't remember who he's with right now, and I'm going to LA next week. I hope mm-hmm. to see him. But uh, Curtis, I don't know somewhere in there probably not long after my my amazing experience with uh, at scott's house uh he really wired it up in a, in a proper way with the right cable and length of cable and all that but but he got me hooked in with this uh, that ground control thing and at that time speaking of pedals we we did include some pedals in the back because i had so many options and so many loops okay yeah yeah you know i think i had a 
I, I've got I, it's the stuff is still in the back. I mean, there's a there's a rat pedal in there that uh-huh. I used for some kind of overdrives and and an octaver and I, I can't remember what else is back there. Probably a phase ninety or something. And uh, but those were just in loops. But that was an early switching system, uh-huh. uh, the ground control, and it was pretty slick. You know, it was a it was a pretty uh, creative thing that happened to racks when all of a sudden you didn't have to do the dance uh, tapping pedals you know? yeah absolutely absolutely alright I love those stories about the old gear and, and the monster rack being assembled so cool we're going to start talking guitars soon with Joe but I'm just taking this short break to remind you that today's episode is brought to you by Fretboard Biology the online guitar course put together by Joe Elliott and drawing on his years of experience as the head of guitar at the Guitar Institute of Technology in LA as well as the McNally Smith Music School as well good times the links are in our show notes all right let's get back to the conversation with Joe what what guitars were you playing back then? Um, I have a 1979 Fender Strat, maple neck, ash body, and I have an ES335. And those were my main guitars. I've got a 59 Martin acoustic that I've had since I was in high school. It's a 0018E. There's a picture of that on my website. I've too. seen that. It's got that big pickup in the sound hole. It's fact, factory pickup. Yeah. And wow. I've since put a... Um, uh, another pickup in that thing that sounds fantastic. I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass myself and not remember the name of the pickup the guy put here for me. But it's a uh, uh, that guitar sounds fantastic. In uh, early '90s, uh, a friend of mine built uh, a custom Strat for me that I still play today. A builder named Ted Kellison up in Montana. Okay. Yeah. And um, on my website is a picture of this red Strat and. Um, I, you know, I've been playing that guitar for, God, 26 years now, and uh, it's just it's home for me. Okay. And it's got yeah. a wide range of of tones. I mean, I do a fair amount of R and B, funk, rhythm guitar playing here, and it's got all of that that I need. Uh, I can get up on the neck pickup, roll off the high end, and get a credible jazz tone out of it. Uh, I can move into any other positions. I can go on the on the the bridge pickup and uh, crank it up on the album. I used uh, T.J. Helmerich's M- Marshall that everybody in, in L.A. seems to use okay. <laughs> for recordings, <laughs> and it sounds great with that with that Marshall okay. as well. Yep, so yep. it's a very versatile Strat. So uh, I've been playing the same same basic guitars for a long time. I bought other ones that I use for as tools for things if if uh if the session calls for that you know i, I have a, a a telly and i've got a godan and i've got a, a vga excalibur that i rarely play that's a beautiful guitar mm-hmm. um i used to have a bunch more gibsons i had a es330 uh which is a you know, 335 without the wood block and i had an es350 and uh, I do have a Howard Roberts Fusion guitar, which is uh, oh, okay. was given to me on my graduation day from GIT. Wow! And uh, that's a that's a fantastic X as well. So there are pictures of all of them are on the website. So yeah, I've had a I've had a scroll through. That. Man, it's it's awesome. That Kellison guitar does that have twenty three frets? Yeah, that's what everybody says. <laughs> and and the story behind that was. Ted's building it. He goes, how many frets you want on, on this thing? And I said, well, how many can you get me in there? And he says, well, I think I can give you 23. I said, all right, give me 23. <laughs> and so <laughs> so uh, couldn't quite get 24 with that neck pickup where it needed to be. Yeah, that's the um, thing. That's the thing with 24. The, the neck pickup, it's just not quite in the right spot. Right. So, you know what? I To me, it's not weird. I mean, if I if if, if I need an E, yep. it's a half-step bend, and I'm there. Yep. And... Um, so, um, yeah, and the the uh, the uh, fretboard on that guitar is uh, it's 120 year old Brazilian rosewood wow. that was harvested before it was illegal. He bought a he bought a cache of that stuff uh, years and years ago when he was starting out as a builder, and uh, it's it's beautiful. 
uh, rosewood. And uh, but uh, yep, that's that's the main guitar. Fantastic. And are they the original pickups? Yeah, uh, those are uh, you know Duncan it's a fifty-seven in the back, and then yep. uh, uh, those uh, uh, bar pickups in the front. Yeah, the like middle. kind of the so, single coils with the rail. Yep, rail kind of thing. Yeah, and nice. it's you know very versatile, really versatile guitar, uh, sound wise, tone wise. So that's why I can use it for so many different things. Yeah, so. cool. Hey, let's talk about your um, your latest album, Truth Serum, which I'm assuming has a lot of that guitar on there. It's pretty much only that guitar on there. There's there's very. Uh, I don't think I used much of anything else on that. There's a couple a couple tracks where uh, my nylon string Godin is is in the back somewhere, and I think I might have used the '79 Strat for a couple rhythm tracks. Uh-huh. But uh, all of the anything that's, of course, it's all instrumental. So all the all the leads and and main line, the head stuff is all done on that Kellison Strat. Yeah. Awesome, fantastic. There's some great tracks. My, one of my favorites is. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this right. Kalugu, Kalugida, Kalugida, Kalugida. There's a really yeah, sweet uh, story that, behind that name. Do, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, my one of my older brothers and my sister, before I was born, when they were toddlers, would play out in the front of the house, in the gutter. And they would, uh, you know, they'd stand on the curb and they'd drag their sticks through the muck and the the goop that's in the in the gutter <laughs> and uh you know how little kids do when you're two and three years old you just like to make that mess and that word kaluji da you know uh i it's one of those words that you know i think my mom must have said you know what do you guys do we're playing with the kaluji da or whatever it was some <laughs> some some you know group of syllables came out of their mouth and then it became this family word which is kaluji da which you know Decades and decades later, is still part of our our larger family <laughs> vocabulary. But Kaluji Da is anything that's like clutter or or muck or you know it's it's a it's a catch all term uh, that that's what it means. So if you if you're cleaning out your garage, you're you probably end up sweeping up a lot of Kaluji Da in the end. <laughs> so <laughs> I love it. That's, but um, it's a long, it's a it's a long, long, long tune, and it's yeah. got a lot of segments in it. Yeah. And um, most, you know, all the, pretty much all those tunes on, on that uh, on that album were written uh, as as you know they wanted. I wanted to write songs. I'm, I'm more of a songwriter, I think, than than really a guitar player. But but I also they were vehicles for. Uh, improvisation at, mm-hmm. at the baked potato gig to be honest i mean that's yeah. where those things were played the most you know um and so all those were written with that band in mind which was a great band at the time uh with steve wangard on keyboards and andre berry on bass and tim mcintyre on drums and there were other people who came in and played too yeah cool there's a great drum solo actually on that track yeah tim mcintyre from from calgary canada he's a he's a a teacher at at MI. He's a, one of the uh, longtime drum instructors there. Okay. A great straight ahead bebop drummer too. Yeah, nice. Yeah. That's probably one of the more fusiony tracks, I guess. There's some really cool unison kind of riffs going on. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely the 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 most in your face. One of the most in your face tunes on there. Mm-hmm.
producing that track, we're trying to have the aggression that can happen in a live performance come across the track was was uh, it, it, it's hard to do to, and make it uh, fit in with the rest of the tracks on the, on the album as well. So, um, but uh, I I was reasonably happy with the way we were able to keep some continuity through the through the production of the whole project. So yeah, cool. Um, what else? Can we, I've made notes on, on a bunch of songs. I, I really enjoyed the album. Um, Ode to well, thank you. Was it Ode to Elaf? Ode to Elaf. So what that means? That's a play on words. Elaf is a is a is an acronym for uh, '80s LA fusion. <laughs> so and and of course an That's ode right. is is a, would be a song that would be you know a, a story about yeah, or okay. something in tribute to. So mm-hmm. that song. Uh, actually, you know, that thing was written since I've been in, in, in Twin Cities. And I, you know, when I was writing that, I thought, God, this just sounds like the, the like, you know, the, the, the stuff Larry Carlton or, or Lee Rittenauer or any of those guys were doing in the early 80s. You know, I mean, it's definitely a throwback kind of sounding song. So it's Ode, Ode to Elaf. It's, it's Ode to uh, Early <laughs> LA Fusion. You know? That's just one of the tracks that's got some really great horn parts. Did you arrange those, or were you involved in those parts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did did the uh, the horn stuff I did on there? Um, uh, the uh, the ballad, the blues ballad, "Tears" is uh, the horn stuff on that. That's actually four trombones played by one guy, oh, but wow. it's uh, overlaid. But uh, that was uh, that was fun to arrange as well, along with. Uh, the strings, which are overlaid, and then uh, actually after all that was done, I brought in uh, my good friend Ricky Peterson, who's um, a great Hammond B3 player yeah, yeah. who lives here, and uh, almost all the Hammond stuff on the album is, is Ricky. Okay. And uh, it's just a, uh, what a what a spark in my life that guy's been moving here. Um, Ricky's just um, a fantastic musician and producer, and you know, was part of the Prince camp for many years. I mean, he was out at Paisley Park, and he's uh, on tour with Stevie Nicks now, and he's been with David Sanborn for 35 years. And wow. so we've struck up a, a great friendship here and are writing partners and, and do a lot of work. But his contributions to the album were uh, significant in not only in playing, but just in, in uh, just advice about, uh, producing it because he's produced so many records and he's worked with all the great, all the great New York guys. <laughs> you name it, he's he's been there with them. So, uh, got to definitely give a shout out to him. Awesome. I was going to ask you about the um, the Afro Latin kind of vibe on on Ferius, but you've sort of already explained where that comes from from that back from those LA kind of gigs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I I was really uh, fortunate to play with. Uh, you know, nothing was very pure, one thing or another. I don't say that. That's that's with great respect. I say that, and mm-hmm. uh, there wasn't much of of the the Latin music I played in L.A. It was purely one thing or another. It was such a great blend of a lot of different things yeah, because, right. uh, you know, maybe some of the the, the Tex Mex things that I played were 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 pretty pure. But even that's a blend. I mean, all music is ultimately a a, a fusion of something. Uh, but that. Um, you know, I got to play uh, with some great Brazilian musicians, um, 
the band I, I mentioned before uh, with Carol Rogers, who was Sergio Mendez's singer for so many years, she used to bring in to our band really great Brazilian musicians, Renato Neto, who's uh, just a phenomenal Brazilian keyboard player. He, he had Prince ties as well. And as uh, you know, ironically, but uh, you know, when I got to play with those guys and and read those charts and sort of um, look under the hood of how those parts all fit together, uh, you know, it can't help but rub off on you. Yeah, definitely. That's that's awesome. Um, ain't it great to be crazy? You bust out some rock and roll chops over that one. <laughs> well, it's you know, I, I if. If I were, you know, it's kind of interesting uh, to, in my mind, where where uh, where the influences come for for particular tunes, and and for me that that tune is re reminiscent of things that I w picked up uh, through osmosis from Larry Carlton and Robin Ford. To me, I, you know, I don't hear the rock thing so much. I hear I hear those guys, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how many hours I spent listening to those guys. But it's it's aggressive, and it's, you know, Sigley Dan sort of groove because yeah, I was, yeah. you know, that's a that's band shuffle. I listen to yep. an awful lot, you know. And so you, you, you tend to, to you know, you, you put everything, all the input goes in your brain all these years, and then it gets mixed up, and that's what comes out, you know. Well, with that song, yeah, I'm, I'm, my first thought is there's some rock kind of kind of a vibe, but then there's some tasty chord changes, which seems to be a mark of your work, pop in there as well. There's the, well, there's a there's a spot in the middle of ain't, ain't It Great to Be Crazy where you know Steve Weingart plays this very ethereal uh, and harmonically complex solo, uh, and it's sort of floating and. Then we break it down, and I I go completely the opposite direction. Just you know, straight ahead rock blues coming out of it. You know, just the kind I, I wanted that contrast, and so mm -hmm. just straight gut rock blues coming out of it. So um, that was intentional. You mentioned uh, TJ Helmich, so you had his amp. Is that a JCM 800? Yeah. yeah. Cool. There's a picture of it on the website. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Uh, TJ is, a, is a, I don't know if you've ever had TJ on, but TJ is a, uh, he's been a friend of mine since the late 80s. And okay. of yep. course, um, I don't know how much of his work you know, but you know, not only is he a great guitar player, but yeah. he's a, a great engineer and great soundsmith. Uh, for all kinds of things. I mean, he's well known for uh, drum sounds and all sounds. Okay, and so yep. uh, uh, I'm actually hooking up with TJ via phone tomorrow to go through some uh, new amp plugins that I, I want to get uh, in uh, in my Pro Tools rig oh, here. Okay. So nice. um, 
but TJ uh, got very generous with his time and gear uh, on my first album, which is not on the website or available years ago. TJ uh, brought out his, uh, I don't know if you remember the juice extractor, which was a power soap device. Yeah, that kind I, of scale I, down, yeah. Right. I yeah. came out of my Boogie 295 uh-huh. into the juice extractor. And of course, the the 295 is just cranked and crank, everything's maxed. And then the juice extractor brings it down to just a whisper almost, but with the the sound of the tubes being worked. So, but uh, TJ's uh, Marshall on there, uh, he and Brett Garcet used have used that amp on I think almost all of their uh, uh, records that okay, they've done together. Okay, cool. That's yeah, awesome. So. Uh, when I'm hearing your tone, how much, how much of the breakup? Because your breakup is so tasty. How much of that is the is the Marshall, or are you pushing the front end of that with with any pedals or anything, or are we mainly hearing the amp? It's all amp. Wow. It's all amp it, except for there were three tunes that I did not use the Marshall on, and uh, that would be the the ballad Tears, the the blues ballad I was uh-huh. talking about. Yeah. Ode de Elaf. And then uh, distant early warning, and with those I ran those uh, through a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe, and I used Greg Cox um, uh, called a gristle gristle. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of so, this. So I don't know if you do you know Greg. Ah, uh, no, of Greg, definitely, yeah. Yeah, Greg uh, is a friend of mine, and and uh, we have him at at the college where I am here, McNally Smith College of Music. We have him. He was on staff here for one year, and then we have him back as artist in residence. So he's also another guy, a great resource like like Scott Henderson or Alan Hines, uh-huh. these guys who are exposed to all this gear all the time, and you can call them up and say, hey, what do you think of this? And they've already done all the homework. Yeah, you know? nice. So, so anyway, that's a great pedal. That Gristle Tone is, mm-hmm. is uh, Gristle King is, is a great pedal. It's got two stages of gain. I use it in a pedal board all the time. as uh, It's just a clean boost. And then there's uh, the first stage of gain, which is, uh, you know, just that slight breakup yeah. for nice singing lines. You know? But, but most, of the, most of the album is, is just uh, that uh, TJ's Marshall and then a 57, mm-hmm. you know. Fantastic. That's all it is. Fantastic. Simple. I'm hearing, you earlier mentioned um, that you're a stereo guy. I'm hearing the stereo delay, which is very, very subtle. So are you adding that at the board afterwards? On the album, yes. Yeah. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, we did it differently on different, different cuts. Um, um, you know, I didn't go so far. Uh, there have been other projects where I've actually, you know, when I do rhythm guitar parts here, when when I've given control of it, I double almost everything. I'll play it and pan it left and right, okay, you know, or yep. instruct the engineer to do so. Uh, or if I do it at home, I you know, and I'm sending stuff to somebody. I'll ask them to you know, this is how this should sound. Don't put it up the middle because it'll sound funny and out yeah, of phase. Sure. But, um, but the, the the solo sounds on that, um, we had uh, in some cases. There's a uh, uh, a slight five millisecond delay that might be panned hard one way and the and the main sounds up the middle and then there are longer delays hard left and hard right okay. that are are timed yeah nice, nice. Uh, one of the one of those sort of re- revelations that day with was guy henderson i talked about earlier was setting up your long delays 350 and 450 which i guess was the famous jeff beck setting okay uh and uh, of course that's that's good for live if you don't have time to time everything yeah and it, and if it's eq'd right it's it's the perfect shadow delay time you know mm-hmm. so what what's your secret with eqing those long delays well that the secret is there's not much secret i just cut the high end <laughs> off a lot that's the you know yeah, okay. and I and and I don't boost any of the lows. You you don't want uh, extraneous noise. What I don't want is the is the rack 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 of the of the delay just getting in the way. Sure. But I also don't want the din of of sort of a low or a low mid thing. You know, carrying out too far. You just you want that. It's uh you know I when I'm teaching students about setting up 
pedal boards or whatever, I'm always describe it as a, sh- a delay being a shadow, mm-hmm. you know, more than a, a really a delay. It's, it's a shadow of what you're doing and it follows you around mm-hmm. and nice. it, it's, it's, it's like the, um, the sustained pedal for, uh, an acoustic piano, you know, it just, it gives you that, that, that body, you know, sure. that, that tails the note. Nice. So. Are you doing any guitars direct? Um, I asked this because on Twisted Cowboy, underneath the bass solo, there's these really great compy chords, and they sound direct. They, in fact, you mentioned Prince; they remind me of that direct Prince kind of tone. How, how are you getting that sound? Yeah, almost all the rhythm guitar is direct. Oh, okay. On the on the whole whole project, just because I've become accustomed to doing that here, yep. and it's it's rare even for distorted uh, stuff where I uh mic and amp anymore i mean if you know if i do another uh or when i do another album of, of my own uh you know i don't know what i'll do i don't know if i'll if i'll go to la and and hijack pj's you know marshall and bring it up here or whether i'll whether i will have discovered some modeling uh plug-in that i that i just think is is fantastic there's so much great stuff out yeah, there sure. now and, and i'm uh, so uh yeah all that rhythm guitar stuff is 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 direct right in there's a uh, uh sometimes i'm going through uh an old uh boss gt5 effects uh, process oh yeah just yeah. um i because i use that in my my studio all the time as, mm-hmm. as just a preamp just get a little bit of a preamp sound before i go direct in into pro tools but um yeah most of it's straight in yeah, cool. Very good. Well, the, yeah, the album sounds amazing. It's beautifully produced and great tunes, and it's a real band effort. It's a guitar album, of course. You're the main voice, but um, there's a lot of room for your bandmates to stretch out as well, which I really liked. So, yeah, congratulations on, on Thank launching. Thank you. So Truth Thank Serum you. is the name of the album. What's, what's the best way for people to keep up to date with you and get a hold of the record, that sort of thing? Uh, it's on CD Baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Truth Serum, uh, Joe Elliott, and that's uh, same as the guy from Def Leppard. Two L's, <laughs> two T's. Yeah, I found that out. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, they can go to my website, which is joeelliottguitar dot com, mm-hmm. and that too with two L's and two T's on on Elliott, yeah. and um, that'll direct you to CD Baby. And there's there are physical CDs available if you're if you like that. And there are downloads available, and it's on uh, Spotify, iTunes, and uh, Apple Music. So it's not hard to find. Awesome. And uh, and I would uh, love to hear from from everybody. And uh, um, I'm getting ready to. Uh, I've been writing with with uh, Ricky Peterson, and uh, we've got we've got enough stuff for another one. So <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Great, would love so, to hear that. Are you doing any gigs to promote the album? I will be. Uh, right now, with uh, my my obligations at the at the college where I am, McNally Smith College of Music, yeah. uh, and um, the uh, uh, sort of the scene here. Some of the guys that I would use, Ricky's out of town with uh, Stevie Nicks, and some of the other guys. Uh, his brother who plays bass for me lots. He's out on the road too, and um, so. Right now, my guys are, are not here. Sure. Uh, so, but yeah. we'll do we'll do something later in the spring. Uh, I'm going to LA next week to do a gig at the Baked Potato. But we'll do a, uh, it'll be with a different band. Uh, uh, it's, it's working with a, a singer named Anna Mule from uh, Iceland, and, and we're doing the Baked Potato. And cool. we might do a couple of the the tunes that are that don't require so much rehearsal. Uh, probably to open or close a set there okay so sure. um but right now uh that I'm, I'm not doing much with that band hope to hope to in the summer so sure. that sounds great that sounds great well joe thank you so much for your time it's been great to hear about um an incredible career a rich and varied career and one that's still very much in full swing so thanks for joining us here on the guitar speak podcast thanks so much for having me i really had a ball so thank you All right, there you go. That was my original conversation with Joe Elliott. 
back in 2017. That album, Truth Serum, is killer. I highly recommend that you check it out. And also, of course, the Fretboard Biology course, which was designed by Joe and drawing on all that experience as a teacher in those amazing guitar colleges. All right, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Matt Wakeling. You've been listening to the Guitar Speak podcast. And as legendary German rocker Michael Schenker once told me, Keep rocking, keep on rocking. All right, catch you next time, everyone. Bye now.